Good evening. This is the Town of Littleton Board of Health meeting for Wednesday, November 30th, 2022. Uh, it's seven o'clock. Uh, we will get started with our public hearing on the ID decision and support tool and discuss uh, any COVID updates in the community. Um, first, I'd just like to, to say um, I distributed some supplies over to the vaccination clinic uh, that they were holding at the high school yesterday. Um, two boxes of tests, two boxes of hand sanitizer, uh, and some masks, and um, they seem to have a lot of success um, distributing that. Uh, last month, it was totally gone. Um, everybody, everybody took advantage of that. So, yay, um, Matt Wason. I don't know if you have an update for us on the on the tool. You bet. So here is the latest information. Um, lots of variants out there recently. Um, for New England, BQ1 is the most prevalent, but BQ1.1 is kind of right behind it, just a few percentage points back. And then BA5 is still pretty predominant. Um, so I think it's an interesting time because we effectively have four variants that all have reasonable penetration in the community, um, which just probably doesn't make it easier for us to kind of track and see how things are really doing. And how vaccinations might be working. Um, the talk is that BA5, which we just kind of are getting through and petering off, BA5 was pretty contagious and BQ1 and BQ1.1 are even more contagious. Um, so while the chart on the right looks pretty good in terms of the two week case count as the counts around our community go down, you'll note that, that, all, that those data points are all from just right before Thanksgiving. Um, so I don't, I wouldn't be surprised if things go back in the other direction after people are returning from holiday travel to other places or being around just more people. Um, in terms of our other metrics, the ICU bed access still hovers in the low 80%. Our CDC community level has actually dropped to green most recently. Um, the inpatient bed numbers are really low, which is a good thing. The case rate is still kind of middling, but it combines for that CDC level to put us into the green category which is good news. On our vaccinations, um, we're still, I don't know if we'll ever be able to get really good data from the state as to this true up-to-date vaccinations. Um, so what I'm reporting here is the 63% as of um, just two weeks ago, that's the percentage of people in Littleton who have had at least one booster. Unfortunately, at this point, people in Littleton should have had more than one booster. So while this falls into kind of the yellow category of 60 to 80 percent, it, it feels red to me um, simply because I'm sure some of those people got that booster a year ago and haven't potentially gotten one since then. Um, Kevin, thanks for mentioning the vaccination clinic. Hopefully we'll see an effect of that and see these numbers uh, creep back up a little bit, which would make me feel better. But I would still really love to have real data that says, well, this is how many people have had, for example, the bivalent booster that's most recently available. While we're on that topic, uh, we uh, I forgot to mention at our last meeting, but for everyone with children out there, ages five to 11, it is recommended that those folks get a dose of the bivalent booster, which is now available, provided they are at least two months out of their last booster dose. So for a lot of kids, if they got it kind of on the cycle when it was first available, it started in the fall, they probably got a booster this spring or this summer. That's okay, as long as it's been two months, the recommendation is for them to go out and go ahead and get that bivalent um, as soon as possible. And those vaccinations are available at local pharmacies and other locations, so they're out there. You can get appointments for that. Moving down the wastewater numbers, they do not paint as happy a picture as our other data. Um, the southern source has climbed over 1,000, and it has been climbing steadily, gone 600s, 700s, 800s, 1100s. So those are all going in the wrong direction. The north isn't quite as steep of a curve, but it has also basically gone from like the 300, 400s up to 700. This data is as of uh, November 28th, so it's a little more fresh, but there's some there's a delay in how when the measurement's taken and the data is reported. Um, and there are definitely some holes in the data around the holidays. Um, but 
But I would still say this is a concerning sign that things are probably on the rise again. And I'd love to say that it's all green and it's all hunky dory, but um, I think this is another one of those, the holidays just happened. It would not surprise me if all of our community <laughs> numbers start going in the wrong direction now. Um, as we continue to watch this data, we will learn more about it. And if this red number doesn't turn into something in our community, then we'll try to learn from that and see how we can better predict. But um, I think our next meeting's in, is it still in two weeks? Mm -hmm. Okay, the 14th, yeah. So um, we'll have a different picture by then and I think it'll help inform us as to how well these correlate. Questions or comments? Um, I love the data. Um, also want to mention RSV loveliness. Um, so, you know, just because it's a, right now a, in a disease of the young and it is, it is not a disease only of the young. So everybody out there, you can get RSV and it can be ugly. So be extra, extra special careful uh, about that. Um, so that's there. And uh, that's the only thing I wanted to bring up was that because that's hitting the community pretty hard as well. So it sounds like it might be appropriate to <clears throat> maybe issue just a statement or a PSA regarding the wastewater numbers climbing. And we, you know, might want to, uh, you know, just loop the, the school committee in, let them know that, you know, they might be faced with staffing shortages uh, and increased absence rates um, <clears throat> within, the next, within the next couple of weeks leading up to Christmas. Um, yep. I don't know if you all feel that's appropriate, but I feel like um, I, I, I think it is. And I, I would almost go to say, you know, people are once again, maybe, maybe you should go put some masks on when you're out in public, if you so choose. Um, this is a concerning period. We're not going to have more data for a couple of weeks um, unless you want to check it yourself. So I would say yeah, it might be a good time to throw this back on. As Kevin mentioned, RSV is out there. Lots of infections are going around. So maybe just kind of go ahead, put those masks on for a couple of weeks and maybe it'll just smooth things out. So more of a mask advisory. Yeah. yeah. I think we should definitely send a letter out just to say, hey, wastewater's heading in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, thanks for if filing that data, Matt. If I could, before we change gears, um, a thought about our test kits, because we still have a reasonable number of test kits, correct? Yeah, we still, we did uh, allocate, um, I think somewhere around 1,200 to 1,500 to Littleton Public Schools to distribute prior to Thanksgiving break. Okay, good. good. Um, and we, we, you know, in, in my opinion, uh, if they were to request some more, uh, we should have those available. Uh, for return after the holiday break. Yeah. Because I'm starting to think those those tests, when do they expire? Do they expire in January? Yep. Okay. I so they, I have, they, all, they all had another 12 months on them. Did they get, I, I knew they got six from July. Jim knows, yeah. he's ready. Jim, yep. So we have a chart on the wall. I can certainly check the... Um, the, the a lot number on the kits. We're thinking they're somewhere in January, February. So okay. yeah, uh, it's, I'm thinking January, like beginning of January. I thought they were a little bit later, but let me check the uh, the chart we have and check your your, um, your lot numbers up there and see what the number may be. Yeah, I got one. I think it was labeled with January 23rd, but it wasn't from the town. So, um, but so I think it warrants checking because two things. Number one, what are we going to do if we're still sitting on hundreds of kits? And now would be the time to try to figure out if there's a way to distribute them. Potentially, like you're saying, if the schools wanted to do some larger scale testing, if it was optional to try to get good counts before holidays, after holidays. Um, and then the, the other piece for me is uh, mm -hmm. obviously the U.S. Postal Service and the, the U.S. government and the state government, they all got these kits out to us over the past year or so. But now I, I look forward to a potential vacuum all of a sudden when there aren't test kits really available um, because we won't have any. And do we have a plan? Should we look to be purchasing or obtaining another set of them for the spring? I'm sure the state will come out with another um, 
distribution program as they had. Um, but I don't know that for certain, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if we got an email in January now that all the tests they have distributed have expired. That, right. You know, we have more or not. I don't know. Would it be okay if we asked Jim to reach out to his contacts to see if he knows, or, you know, somebody in the DPH that could at the state level to say, Oh yeah, we're looking at doing a purchase, blah, 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 blah. If I can speak to that, Kevin, um, the last, uh, they have these uh, uh, every other week public health meetings, and uh, we were told that it doesn't seem like they're going to be another distribution of kits. Okay. Um, and what the state was saying is the community's got um, you know, monies for this type of work, and that, that's probably where the kit should be being purchased from. So that may change. Um, again, if they find another warehouse full of these that they need to get rid of, Yes, maybe they'll be sending them out again. But uh, last we heard, um, there wasn't a plan for that. Good. Is the sorry? Can I ask another question? Um, would it um, make sense? Uh, or do the bleh, did the state put together a vehicle for towns to purchase the test kits through? Like, is there a an omnibus package that has the ability to go and do a, a purchase at state levels? At you know state pricing levels. There is. So um, through the um, state um, procurement system, uh, they do have companies that have posted uh, prices. We, we tried to do that early on, try to get a bunch of communities together, because at that time you had to order large quantities and we just couldn't pull enough people together to order them. But I believe those state contracts are up there for town. Ta I believe towns can use those uh, contacts to purchase. And, and I don't know what the right number is. I mean, do we need a thousand on hand? Do we need a hundred on hand? Um, you know, let, let I just speak, want to be prepared. Let me speak with Lynn Snow and see if she needs more for January. And then I'll get sort of a plan. I'll get her plan on, you know, what they would like to do for the remainder of the year, um, returning from February vacations and April vacations and so on and so forth. And, you know, I, I think that by law, they have to provide, they're going to provide someone, they have to provide everyone a test. And, um, you know, I think that's like 2000 tests every time. So let me speak with her on that. And, you know, if we can, if we say that, you know, the new test won't expire until January 24, um, you know, then we can, we can make an order with some numbers in mind, uh, based on what we know and, and what, what, what other people want to do with them. The other thing that seemed to happen, and, and we weren't aware of it until we heard about it, it seems like the I don't know if the state gave the schools kids to give to students just before Thanksgiving. I think they got some small number just you know, to be able to test before they came back. So it sounded like they provided a very small number and kind of targeted uh, at the holidays. So whether they, whether through the Department of Early and Secondary Education, they decided they might provide schools with like spot kits just before holidays so that people, you know, students would test and teachers would test before they came back. I, I don't know if they'll continue to do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So if there are no more questions, uh, we can move on to our next item. Uh, 705 public hearing with 12 Field Lane, Dan and Nicole Camba, review of materials for a deed restriction. I will promote them now and let everyone know about the conversation I had with town council this morning. Hi, Nicole. Hi, Kevin. Just state your name and address for the record. Nicole Camba, 12 Field Lane, Littleton, Mass. And Dan, if you can hear us, could you do the same? Dan Camba, 12 Field Lane. Right, thank you. Uh, so I appreciate uh, you guys sending in all the information. We have the, um, the floor plans, uh, the proposal, the photos. Um, did you Did you have a hand in that spreadsheet? Nicole and Dan, or was that something that Marin was working on? I know it just sort of appeared in our packet. 
We did all of that. Okay, great. Um, so I had a conversation this morning with town council, uh, just as a follow-up. Um, he is advising the board to not issue any more deed restricted home expansions until we circle back with the owners of the HOA. Uh, in his, in his opinion, in his opinion, we need to be having these conversations with the HOA and the homeowners, um, in tandem, uh, sort of at the same time, we need to confirm how many houses in the development exceed the three bedroom limit. Um, and we need to make uh, sure we have not exceeded the allowable flow. Uh, we need to make sure that every house that exceeds three bedrooms uh, receives a deed restriction. Uh, and this is all for the ultimate protection of you, of the homeowners, and everybody that is a part of the homeowner association. Uh, in his words, uh, we are careening towards an expansion of a system that is already on the threshold of being a uh, DEP regulated wastewater treatment plant. And if the DEP steps in, they are going to, you know, it's going to be quite the headache and quite expensive uh, and they, for everyone and they, and they will blow this up. So we need to, we need to do this the right way. Um, and we just need to understand <clears throat> the homes that, you know, exceed the room counts allotted for the flow of 330 gallons per day. Um, so with that said, uh, we are going to invite uh, the fields who are currently in charge of the HOA to our next meeting on December 14th. Uh, we have to run through the spreadsheet, determine from blueprints and building permits, how many rooms are in each house, what the counts are, what the allowed flow is, what the actual flow is, circle back with the HOA and make sure we do this uh, in the correct way and, and not rush into it. Um, so with that said, I, you know, we can, um, you know, we can continue, we can do two things. We can continue this or we can deny the request. Um, in my opinion, you know, I think it would, likely be better to to continue it to December 14th and hope that the fields are there so we can discuss with them all the numbers and uh, the plan moving forward. We just had the meeting this past Monday to um, for the transition of the trust from the fields to owners. Um, but, and I know Dan's on the new board, Dan, is that effective already? Or is that effective one, one? It's effective. Now we signed everything with the lawyer. So we, we now have the residents as the HOA. And how um, does that work? Who do we talk to? Like, who's the, who's the representative? The president is, well, we still have to have our first meeting to to elect officers and all, but there's five of us. So okay. I'll, I'd be the one probably passing this along to them. Okay. So you currently now have, uh, the fields are, are no longer a part of this development and the HOA. Correct. As far as I know, I think certain things they have until one, one to, to give us all their backup and whatever we need to get accounting wise and, and things. But, as of Tuesday, Monday, whenever it was, we signed in the new trustees. And are those yet to be named? Uh, or do you have all the names of those folks? We have all the names okay. right now. If you could forward me the email uh, forward to Brenda, whoever's email address you have, um, names of those folks, I'll forward it over to the town council and uh, we'll make sure those folks get invited. And if there are any, um, if there are any paperwork involved uh, that you can send us on that, the new HOA arrangement, that would be great too. Sure. Um, as far as this permit, what um, if we withdraw it now, are we able to resubmit one later on once all of this is figured out? So there's not just one hanging out there? Yeah, I don't see why not. So, so I guess I'll leave that uh, up to you guys what you would like us to do. 
or what you would like to do? I think we're leaning towards just withdrawing it at this point. It sounds like there's quite a bit of work to undo the issues that have been created. So rather than sit around and wait for that, I think if that ever gets fixed, we'll resubmit a permit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Dan, if I could, I, I think the way the process would work is that you would eventually with an idea like this, go to the HOA first, get their approval. And then the HOA would come to us with the plan. Does that sound right, Kevin? Yes. So, so I agree. I think point, withdrawing this right now is fine. And they would just in the future, probably add that step for anybody in the community that would be asking for work to be done. It would go to the HOA first for that internal approval before coming to before us. Okay. So with that said, I will, I'll continue. Um, well, I guess we'll, we'll create a new public hearing with the new HOA folks for December 14th. And I'll make a motion uh, to close this public hearing. Is there a second? Second. Motion in the second. Roll call vote. Kevin Davis. Kevin Davis, yes. Gino Fratelloni. Is that a yes? Well, he figures it out. Matt Wason. Yes. Wason, yes. I got Gino's yes. Kevin Baker votes yes. Thanks, Nicole and Dan, for your patience. Um, we'll hopefully have better news on December 14th. Yeah, thanks. We'll move on to our public hearing for 17 Edwards Drive. Uh, John Bowden represents the property regarding deed restriction for a finished basement. Where is this? Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, John, just state your name and address for the record. Sure, John Bowden, 17 Edward Drive in Littleton, Massachusetts. How can we help you? Uh, thanks for the time this evening. I have a building permit open for finishing my basement. Uh, I, I submitted the permit back in January of 2021. Did have a conversation with Mr. Garathi around the need to get clarification on a variance. Um, attempted to do so, was not able to get that to done. Um, coming confronting the board and coming to the board and take and stating my case back at that time. So I'm here now to do that. I'm in the process of selling my house and um, need to resolve this open permit issue with the town. So um, I did submit some documentation. Would you like me to share? Uh, we, we, I think we have it in our packet. Uh, is it the uh, yes December 30, 2020 mm -hmm. letter? Yeah, there's plus the, the three or four documents, visuals that follow. Yeah, there's a, yes, I, I do, I guess there's one question I do have. There's been a conversation around nine rooms. I went in doing, pulling the my data. I don't know what the builder submitted as the latest drawing, but I don't believe the drawing that's in the town's files represents the actual number of room, the actual uh, final design of the house, I guess I'd say. There's a, there, and then, so does a room get quantified because it has a door or could, could it be an open entrance into another open entrance that would be defined as a room? I have basically one door creating one room on my first floor. Doesn't show on the plans that I submitted because that's what I signed with my purchase and sale agreement, but I can send pictures or allow somebody to come to the house and show them that. So I don't, I just need some clarification on the nine rooms, first of all. And then there, the whole second piece was there was no communication to me when I bought the house that there was any zone restrictions uh, related to rooms. I actually have, and I submitted this as documentation, the builder actually quoted me an option to finish my basement as part of the uh, original build back in 2017. So I um, guess I'm not sure how all that plays into it, but I just, we need, we'd like to get this clarified and uh, hopefully closed. Sure. So this is the first we're hearing of it. Um, maybe Jim, you could give us some background on it. 
Sure. So um, when the house plans, when the house was originally uh, permitted, uh, plans were submitted for the house drawings. Uh, we reviewed them on a four bedroom septic system. They're allowed to have up to nine rooms. Um, just before the meeting tonight, I kind of went back into the town's permitting system, took a quick peek at the plans. Best I can tell from the plans now, I, I don't know if they were amended in any way, because again, we sign off on a set of plans and don't go into the house afterwards. It's just not part of what we do. But I, I guess I would believe based on that review again, that it had nine rooms. Uh, back when the permit application was, you know, when they applied for it, I put notes in the permit system for the um, applicant to, you know, explaining, you know, the, the number of rooms, uh, the requirements when it exceeds, um, and that they needed to come chat with the board about getting a deed restriction. One additional situation I think uh, Mr. Bowen's referring to, um, this subdivision, um, it's, it's uh, kind of an open space, uh, so they allowed uh, smaller lots and uh, a chunk of open space. But as part of that, uh, they had to do what's called a nitrogen agri aggregation plan. Um, because uh, the way the state essentially dilutes nitrogen on, when you have on-site systems in wells or on-site systems in the zone two of a well, is they require that you have at least 10,000 square feet of lot area for each bedroom. Um, and so each each four bedroom house would need to have nearly an acre. These lots are all a little bit smaller. So part of the approval process was an aggregation plan where they kept a bunch of land, the stuff that was the conservation land, um, and, and combined it with the small lots to make up that difference. So they're they're kind of tight and and they are on the edge of the zone two of the town wells. Um, uh, you, uh, down the street on Wickham Ave is where that town well field is. Um, so again, some additional scrutiny with these lots only because of where they are um, and, and the, um, the approval process that happened in the beginning. Now each deed does have, and again, this goes back to the conversations we had about deeds. I'm not sure how many people read their deeds carefully, uh, but there is a uh, notation in the deeds about this. Uh, it's, it's subject to a nitrogen aggregation plan. So that, and unless you do this for a living, you probably wouldn't even know what that means. Um, so, so that's that's kind of where we are with this. You know, you know, if plans were modified, we're not aware of them. So all we have is the original set of plans, which have nine rooms. The basement was finished into one room, which would have been ten. Right, and if it was, if it was ten rooms, we would need to place a deed restriction on it. Correct, um, and, as, and, and as, again, your old policy kind of mentioned, you know, if it was one over. That I could sign off on it. This is kind of a sensitive area. It's different than most. Yeah, that that, that, that was my next question: is how does yeah. the nitrogen aggregation plan play into this, and and how we can act as a um, I think it just you know you know you obviously you try to use as much judgment as you can on these um, because of the type of development um, and because you know the. The land, the lots are small. You're right in the. I think I think the part of the development is in the zone too. I guess additional care. I want the board to know these things were happening. Still, you again according to Title Five and, and based on Tom's comment Monday, um, I believe you can issue a deed restriction. It's just uh, I think probably more attention too, just because of where these lots are is and, and how the development. Is this a shared a shared system? No, everyone has no. their own septic systems on oh, site. Okay. Right. Yeah, good. Yeah. And, and, and in, the, in the beginning of the development, uh, the water department was kind of pushing to maybe require having you know additional treatment on all the septic systems. Really hard to kind of require because it all met Title Five. So um, you know they were concerned about the, the nitrogen potential nitrogen loading from that mm -hmm. subdivision. So. So I still, I guess I still don't have good clarity around the definition of what constitutes a room. My living room, my family room and kitchen. I think Title V, uh, Mr. Bowden, Title V states 70 square feet constitutes a room. Uh, and Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, but is it over 300 square feet is two rooms? Uh, there used to be a little Board of Health regulation that said over 250 square feet, you count it as two. So. Yeah. So just for the board's sake, and I think I had sent some of this information out, when we look at um, room counts, you know, a lot of houses are built open concept. Um, and, and I think this comes into full view when you look at a real estate listing for a house. You know, we may look at a house with open concept and say, hey, look, at it's only one big room. We look at it as room uses. So if a kitchen 
goes into an area with a dining room, we'd consider the dining room, and it goes into a living room. We'd, so we'd look at that for the purpose of room counts as separate rooms. And and I think that is kind of lines up with the way you know the, the house would be listed real estate wise. So again, I don't think in doing that we're doing anything different than kind of what happens when somebody is uh, considering this house and, and what's in the house. So. Uh, questions and comments from board members, Kevin Davis. Um, okay, so we've got nine rooms, which means we can do a plus one. It looks like there's one finished room and one unfinished room in the basement. Is that what I'm seeing? Yes, the basement was just really one finished room added. The unfinished is unheated. It's a workspace or a storage area. Okay, so board members, I would assume this is our plus one is the finished area then. Do I have that as what people are saying? Yeah. Okay. So if that's the case, then um, then I have, and is this our construction already complete? Correct. Okay. Okay. I'm good. Gino Fratelloni, questions, comments? Gino, do you, can you read me? There you go. Yes, Kevin, what? Do you have any questions or comments? No, thank you. Okay. Uh, Matt Wason? Um, I'm kind of lying with Kevin. I mean, if it sounds like it's following our usual pattern, then I, I think I'm not going to have any um, qualms with it. However, we do typically want to see those plans. So, Mr. Bowden, I don't expect you to try to figure out the room count. I wouldn't want to put you in that position. I would say... Let's get a let's get a easy sketch of the as built that we have, so we can do the count, have it in the record, and then say that's what we're going to do. Okay, so is it is would it be acceptable to take what I have as a you know PDF from the builder and mark it up with my pencils and and, and to de uh, delineate rooms as well as remove walls that are shown on the drawing that don't exist in, in the house today. Is that what you're asking for, Matt? Uh, yeah, I think that would be, I mean, even a hand sketch of what you have, I feel would be, would be okay if you're saying this is what it actually looks like. Um, so yeah, whatever's easiest. If you have got a PDF of at least a start, that'll make it cleaner. Um, but it's just, we, we've done this previously that we get part of the plans and we say, well, just for the record, we need to make sure we've got all the plans when we have our hearings so we can say, we all agree that it's this many rooms. There's no debate about it. So it's nothing against you. It's just yeah. <laughs> that's the pattern we've taken. So yes, that would be sufficient for me. Make notes, say this wall's gone or we put a wall here or whatnot. It doesn't have to be crazy. Just something that says, this is what it basically looks like right now. Okay. And uh, make sure I understand, uh, is the board willing to approve the variance tonight based on uh, this conversation? Well, we'll make a motion yeah. to determine that. But uh, Jim, I have a question. The nitrogen aggregation plan that uh, is in place, what does that consist of? So what essentially what they do is they do a calculation of how much of it, the area is covered by houses and septic systems. Um, they kind of divide out the number of bedrooms and how many acres you would essentially need to be able to meet that uh, nitrogen loading, that 440 um, uh, per acre, um, and then make sure they have enough open land that can't be can't, can't have nitrogen added to it. So you combine the two together and that's how you kind of solve the problem for uh, nitrogen loading. So the, 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 but there's the, no treatment. There's no treatment involved. To no, there's no, it's, it's just dilution. It's just, you're, you're not, you're, you're, you're essentially providing that uh, 40,000 square feet of land area per house. You're just not giving that 40,000 square foot to each lot. The lots, I think, in that division, that subdivision, all range of like maybe sixteen thousand to maybe twenty four thousand, so yeah. a little bit smaller. But uh, all the but, land, all the open space is wet. Uh, wet it's up lens, and there is some okay. some that's yeah. I mean, it's it can't be underwater as part of the calculation. Okay, so it's, it's all land above water. All right, is there a motion? I make a motion that we continue this until we get the prints and plans from the homeowner to our next meeting, and then we can review it and make our final decision. Okay. Excuse me, may I interrupt before you guys vote on that? Uh, Mr. Mr. Bowden, do you have a closing date? <laughs> I do. When is it? December 12th. 
I, I, I don't mean to say like I waited last minute. I know you guys are very busy. This, it has been challenging to get to this point. That's I would say as the homeowner. So I would ask some leniency on the, and can we, can I, is there anything I could do? Drop the drawing off on Friday. Um, uh, well, let, let me make this statement. Uh, Kevin Davis, would you be willing to withdraw your, your motion? I will withdraw my motion. Uh, I'll make a motion to uh, grant the variance uh, with the placement of a deed restriction uh, upon receipt of and review uh, of the as-built floor plan by Mr. Bowden. Second. Uh, roll call vote, Kevin Davis. Kevin Davis, yes. Gino Fratelloni? Yes. Matt Wason? Matt Wason, yes. And Kevin Baker votes yes. Kevin, can I just ask a question? Just so yes. I can understand procedure. So yeah. I just want to make sure I understand. So once he drops the plans off, you'd like me to review them, make sure there's no more than 10 rooms total. Correct. Full house in the basement. Yep. Um, and then he'll need to record the, get the deed restriction recorded on the property. Right. On the uh, deed. Before we can sign off on the building permit for the site. It's, I just want to make sure I understood that. Yeah. So there's some moving parts, Mr. Bowden, and, and time is of the essence. I don't know how quickly the registry is working or your attorneys, but um, yeah. So uh, can I ask one more question? Does, Based on this, I understand the work you guys are asking and required to do before you sign off on the restriction of variance. The town has their portion that they need to finalize. Does does this conversation night? What does the town have to finalize? The building department needs to sign off on all right. the, of the permit. They've signed what? off on the permit. Sorry, let's clarify. Permit signed off. They have not signed off on the final work done. So I need to meet with them to do that. But I haven't done that till this is done. And they don't well, sign off until the Board of Health signs off. So exactly. Would, yeah. So you would need to get the plan to us. Uh, the deed is, once once Jim green lights it, have your attorney do the deed restriction, send us a copy. Then they sign off on the building permit. OK. And is Jim, in order to expedite all this, his email has worked in the past. Would that work if I send you an email of the markup? That, that's fine. Um, what you'll need to do is I can get you the DEP template for the deed restriction that can be completed and, and recorded. Um, and um, you know, once it's recorded and if the plans are all set, then if I understand the board correctly, I can let the building department know the Board of Health is okay with it. Okay. Um, I, I have your email address. We'll, I will take it offline and we'll, we'll follow up. Thank you, Mr. Bowden. Thank you, gentlemen, for the evening. I appreciate the time. Have a nice night. You too. All right, moving on. We have a public hearing for 57 Colonial Drive with Civil Solutions. Point uh, of order, gonna... point of order, Chairman. Yes. Um, Mr. Dan Kane was in the. Ah, never mind. Dan Kane's been promoted. <laughs> Point of order resolved. <clears throat> I've always wanted to say you're out of order, though. <laughs> um, we'll put 57 Colonial Drive, Civil Solutions, groundwater reduction for leaching area and tank outlet inverts. Uh, who do we have? Uh, Kirk Fitzpatrick here uh, being promoted. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, Kirk. Hi, good evening. This is Kirk Fitzpatrick with Civil Solutions, and I'm here on behalf of Terry Nisley for his property at 57 Colonial Drive. Uh, I'm happy to share the plan with you. Please. Um, there's no share button on my desktop. Is that something you can activate? Maybe. If not, <laughs> Dave, if not Dave can. You need to promote him to panel. Yeah, he's oh. I don't even know. He's, I think he is a panelist, no? Did I, oh, no, it's just, it's just talking aloud right now. Oh, okay. Here you go. I just did. There you go, Kirk. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. 
All right, sorry about that. It cut me off for a minute. <laughs> you share the uh, the drawing here. So basically, what we have proposed before you is an upgrade for the existing two bedroom dwelling. Zoom in on the property here. Uh, house is uh, being transferred. It currently has a small septic tank off the left front corner of the house and that feed the leaching area off to the left of the house. Uh, it's serviced by an on-site artesian well. This is the 100 foot radius for that well. So this system failed a Title V inspection. Uh, was determined the existing leaching area was in the groundwater. We went out and conducted some soils testing on the other side of the house, outside the 100 foot offset to the wetland. Uh, the well on the adjacent property is out behind the house and the 100 foot offset does not come across the property line. So we conducted two deep observation holes and a percolation test. So basically the deep observation holes showed some fill and then it changed to a sandy loam and it had a water table at uh, 36 inches in test hole one and 33 inches in test hole two. And the perk test ran at 19 minutes an inch. So what we're proposing is to come out the front of the house with a new 1500 gallon two compartment septic tank. And that's gonna feed a thousand gallon pump chamber. And that's gonna pump the liquid up to a leaching area composed of the geomat. Um, that system is proposed to be pressure dosed. And that's gonna be 34 feet long by 12.4 feet wide. Uh, with the high groundwater, we're asking for a one foot reduction in the groundwater offset with the use of the geomat. So the reduction would be from four feet to three feet. And we're asking for approval under 310 CMR 15.405 1J to allow less than 12 inch separation between the inlet and outlet boots of the tanks and the high groundwater. Uh, the tanks have been kept up as high as possible. They're actually going to be monolithic H20 tanks, so they have a heavy top, and the seam for the tank is at the top instead of in the middle, and they'll be ordered with boots, which will be sealed uh, to prevent any intrusion of liquid in or out of them. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that the board may have. Oops. Sure, Jim, do you want to give us your comments on this first before we ask the board? Sure, so as Kirk kind of pointed out, the existing system may actually be not only in the groundwater, table, but also within 100 feet of the well. So um, this is a, a significant upgrade on the site. Um, using the geomat, they're able to keep the height of the system down because the house, the existing house is pretty close um, to the grade. So building up in that area and shedding water towards the house wouldn't be a good thing. Um, I don't see an issue based on um, the soil testing that we did and the fact that we're able to get everything outside the 100 feet of everybody's wells. Uh, Kirk, I'm curious why you're not asking for a two foot groundwater offset. Uh, historically, on properties that are serviced by an on site well and where there's well on the adjacent properties, Jim prefers to see a three foot offset, and I don't think that's unreasonable. Even with 19 minutes, huh, Jim? Yeah, I mean, that's you just never you never know why somebody's well is going to be contaminated. So I think if you can make this. Uh, as compliant as possible. I think that provides uh, everyone the best protection. Understood. Wells make me nervous. Yeah, I hear you. Particularly when there's no town water available. And the, the grades only can, coming up a foot, I think should yeah. blend in fairly well. If groundwater were higher, I guess I would consider asking for a further reduction, but I think this blends in fairly well with the existing grades. Okay. Uh, board member questions and comments, Kevin Davis. The unmute button wasn't on mute. Okay, so um, I, my general comment about uh, geomats is you can't put anything over the top of it. Um, so if that is a correct assumption, I'd like to see some sort of something in the deed saying nothing built over the geomat um, ever uh, because that'll be a problem. Like somebody might want to put a shed or something on the top of it, so. That's a... If I can address that, I mean, you, nobody wants to put any structure over, over any system. It's it's not unique to the geomat. Um, as far as driving, though, I think. Uh, yeah, you definitely don't want to drive on it, but right. you don't really want to drive on any system if you can avoid it. Yep, I understand, but I know I've I've asked that question before, and that's come true. So I don't know where how the board feels about it. Kirk, uh, is there an operating and operations and maintenance agreement with this? 
No, there's not. So no one's really going to be checking. So I think, um, Kevin, uh, there was one of these that the board approved and approved restrictions to, and and a little different situation in that um, the system was at the end of uh, like a secondary driveway for the house. Yeah, that's what it was. And and I think we asked them, and, and they did end up putting big stones yeah, like uh, a along the edge of it. So, because yeah. in that case there, it's, it's hard to, once it's all backfilled, it's hard to distinguish where the edge of the yeah. gravel driveway is and the beginning of your system is. So uh, in that case there, um, you know, putting bollards or rocks or something that somebody's going to damage the car for us instead of their system uh, seem to be important. This one here, that, they'd have to, a couple of things to address, you know, concerns, Kevin. If, if they were to pull a building permit for a shed, we'd review it and send them a copy of their plan saying, hey, look, you can put the shed here. Um, and that doesn't mean that sometimes people that, with their buddies on the weekend go put a shed someplace, but you know, if they follow the normal process and this one will be a little harder to drive over because you got to almost go around the back of the house to get onto it because of the stone wall in the front. Got it. Yeah. Okay. It's well, that is a stone, so that is a stone wall in the front that really does exist. Yeah. It, it's got a stone wall across the front. The, um, these areas that I'm hovering over are gardens. This is a rather large rhododendron. Uh, okay. There's three, pine, three small pine trees here. This is a four to five foot diameter boulder, and this is a bush next to it. Withdraw comment. Good. Thank you. It, it's got a it's got a pretty good blockade in front of it, I'd say. <laughs> uh, Gino Thank Farrell, you. any questions, comments? <laughs> questions or comments, Gino? No, <clears throat> no comment. Thank you. So far, it looks looks okay. Dan King. Dan Kane has no comments at this point. All right. Matt Wason. No question or comment. Thank you. All right. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to approve uh, uh, grant variance to reduction in groundwater offset from four feet to three feet and allow less than a 12 inch separation between the inlets, outlets of the tanks and the high groundwater. Second. We have a motion and a second. We'll call the vote. Kevin Davis. Kevin Davis, yes. Gino Farrelloni. Yes. Dan Kane. Dan Kane, yes. Matt Wason. Matt Wason, yes. And Kevin Baker votes yes. Thank you, Kirk. Great. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Uh, so moving on, we have a discussion regarding mobile food truck regulations. I know it did not make it in the packet. We had one piece of correspondence uh, that um, did not get sent out to all board members that Jim had sent over uh, regarding a, uh, a, a, a mobile food uh, unit that's in town. I can forward that over to everyone now as long as you do not respond to me um but jim maybe you can just give some background on that and then the other document uh that i sent over to brenda to distribute was 105 cmr 590 uh which is the uh, state sanitary code um regarding food establishments so you know the state has certain regulations in place um, that document in conjunction with the other one you'll receive from Brenda that you've already received from Jim uh, was the food protection program regarding mobile food establishment questions and answers, uh, which I think <clears throat> will, will really help us to sort of form uh, any, any local regs on top of what you see there in the state regs. Um, so we can we can table most of this discussion, but Jim, if you just want to fill everybody in on that correspondence that you had sent, is this for the uh, the existing correct? Unit? Yes. Okay. So um, there's an existing mobile unit that's licensed uh, on Great Road, um, and there's a I think the person who owned it has passed away, um, and so we'll have new ownership, um, and so they would need to be relicensed, um, and you know when the the board back in, I want to say 2010 or 11, or it might have been earlier, had granted a variance to the previous owner of the unit. 
and we were using a different version of the federal food code. Um, and so those things have changed since. Variances generally don't transfer, um, so a, a new owner would need to apply for them. But the food code has changed also. And those two documents um, that we sent out, one was a little bit more detailed, like seven pages of, of kind of point by point of conditions for approval. The other one was more of a question and answer. And the federal food code now would be the basis on which we would um, approve permits. And so that- Are you working on 2017 or 2013? 2013. Okay. Massachusetts 2013. So that information was sent to the new owner um, with a uh, you know, kind of a note to say, hey, we need to get this permitted. Uh, here's the information we'll be using to permit. Um, please put together a plan um, showing where you can and can't meet the code. Um, and, and if there if there's areas where you can't, then you need to go to the board for uh, consideration of variances. Um, the, the, um, the mobile food license, I guess when I think of mobile, I think of something that moves. Um, if you read the shorter document, uh, the state document, the question and answer, it kind of hedges that by saying that can move. And so if some, something had wheels, I assume it can move. Uh, one of the issues, and, and I think it was part of the variances that were granted previously, I think the unit is actually tied in electrically down there. Uh, so, you know, it would take some moving. Um, and some of the concerns, uh, probably the biggest concern we have is um, the, the, the unit has the ability uh, for town water. I think they, they can connect to the building that's there. Uh, but the wastewater is a small container that's beneath the unit. Um, and I don't know the federal food code specifically, but generally, if, if it were truly mobile, so going from place to place and had a water tank and a waste tank uh, on site, uh, the federal food code does address the size of those, those tanks relative to one another. Um, the idea is that you'd want to make sure you had enough tank a waste tank to handle all the water you may generate. And so in this case here, I think they have um, somebody who comes by and pumps the tank, but it's kind of a, a small device that I think you use under uh, tra uh, recreational vehicles. So it is a very small capacity. Our concern is if somebody's working in that unit all day long, you have the ability to run water into it. You just don't have, you have essentially unlimited ability for water. You don't have un un uh, unlimited ability for wastewater. Um, and, and you take to have a situation where consideration of your capacity to hold wastewater may have may force you to make decisions about wear washing or hand washing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, that's a big part, I think, that in the, in the development of the plan by the new owner, those kinds of things need to be brought to the board for consideration. So, again, uh, I talked to the, the new owner, said, hey, once you've got your plans together, I'm happy to sit down or Bridget, happy to sit down and kind of review it. Uh, make sure we're all on the same page so that when they come to the board, if they need to come to the board for variances, we can have most of the issues work out except things that you would need to grant a variance for. Okay. And if the if the access to potable water was limited, as limited as the the wastewater compartment, how does that change the equation? Um, to me, it doesn't make it any better. So okay. the, the concern would be, if, if you were to approve a variance, is one of the things I would say to you is, um, if you have limited water, wastewater capacity, that has a tendency to limit your ability to wear wash and hand wash. And those two things are extremely important, mm -hmm. uh, depending on the prep you're doing inside the unit. So if you're only ever serving steamed hot dogs out there, wouldn't bother me at all. But if you start to do food preparation, it's really important that you're able to wash things and wash your hands um, and so, you know, there's kind of a sliding scale of how you approve and what you approve based on the capacity of the mobile unit. And, and I think it's important to realize that this is the considerations you're making here isn't, aren't really just for here. Uh, it's for anybody else who wants to do a mobile in town. Uh, right. they're, they're popular. Uh, I think we licensed district wide about 30 of them and they're truly mobile. Um, there's another unit down there, I think, waiting to kind of see what you're going to do here. Um, so I think that's that's an important uh, to, to establish a kind of a consistent process, whether it's restricting menu, whether it's restricting however it is, um, you need to kind of balance those two things, the, the ability to do the sanitary component of it and the menu offerings. 
And where, and where is it called out that um, it has to move? What is that in the state? Well, I mean, by the nature of a mobile unit. Yeah, I know. Okay. Um, and so if you, <laughs> words just don't mean anything anymore, I guess. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm, you know, I, I looked at that, that shorter state document and said, even the state hedged in the language and the document saying that could move. Um, understanding that you know maybe sometimes mobiles get placed someplace and don't move, um, but could move if they had to. So, um, and it, and again, it kind of goes back to uh, you know, facilities. Your fixed facilities need to meet the, the full range of the code, so they need to have wear washing. And, and, and uh, again, if you're going to make compromise, there needs to be a reasons why you would, and, and mitigating measures why you would. And furthermore, if we're going to make compromises, it's, it needs to not set a precedent that's going to adversely affect us with future mobile units at any location. And, and I think that's the part that you look at it early on and, and whatever decision you make, you qualify so that if somebody comes and says, hey, you gave it to them, you can say, hey, we gave it to them because right. this, this, this and this. So <laughs> sometimes people seem to think that if you give it to one, you have to give it to all. Mm -hmm. and And if you're kind of thoughtful about your approach to variances and approvals, um, which are allowed to do in the, in the food code, then I think if you qualify, then that's, you know, th that's how you, it, it might not be bad to have a general set of principles by what you're looking at. I think that helps people who are looking to do these things. Mm -hmm. um, but the specifics um, should really be what distinguishes whether you grant something or not, mm -hmm. not the fact that you gave it to somebody else. Okay. Well, I believe the, uh, the one issue <clears throat> we're dealing with now has been placed on the agenda for December 14th. Um, and town council is actually going to be on that meeting too, because of the Cooper farm, Dan, you missed it. Um, you can, you can watch it all later. Uh, town council will be there. So if we have any questions regarding that stuff, we can, we can ask him, uh, Matt Wason, you had a question. Yeah. Jim, along the water concept discussion, are there, I could, I didn't see it briefly going through, are there recommendations for quantities of potable water you need for an establishment based upon number of customers or volumes or something? Or how, how do they know? Because you said there, you said there's a ratio between potable water and wastewater capacity, but how do they know either one of them to calculate the other? So if, if it was a true mobile that had a water storage tank and a waste storage tank, yeah. I think it's, and don't quote me on it, but I think the waste storage tank has to have a one and a half the capacity of the water storage tank. Yeah. But uh, is there guidance on how big the water storage tanks should be? Not that I'm aware of. I have to ask Bridget. I think based on the size of the tank, again, the food, the food code would allow you to limit the operation. So if somebody had a gallon of water kind of capacity, you might say, hey, look, it's just hot dogs or something like that. Uh, yeah. So, again, yeah, this, I don't think that's that level of detail on the requirements for water for a moment. Uh, but I can ask. That becomes, that becomes really hard. Like you say, it's like, well, you need to have enough for washing hands. You need to have enough for your prep. You need to have enough for your cleaning. But good luck. And we might show up later and decide you don't have enough because people are washing their hands too quickly or, <laughs> or you're well, cutting a corner somewhere. <laughs> right. I mean, okay. in the old days, where we used to license the ones that the mobile units that went to uh, job sites, one of the requirements that they had to have was that they had to have uh, bathroom stops, um, you know, places they could stop, go to the bathroom, wash their hands, those kinds of things. But they yeah. didn't often prepare. Most of the stuff they got was they went to a commissary, got the food, put it in the back of the van. They may have gone to the pizza place and got a pizza and thrown it in the back. But they didn't really, and even those had like a small sink that had just, because they didn't do anything other than maybe have to rinse off a utensil if that was the case. So, um, mobile food's gotten a lot more, um, you know, complex and, and more interesting, I would say, and probably better quality. Uh, but all of those things require more facilities. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, it's one of the things that we could recommend if they have a limited water is um, like, you know, once they use a utensil, they put it in the dirty bucket. And then at the end of the day, they take the dirty bucket that has all the utensils and they take it back to wherever their facility is and they clean all of those things. And then that's, you know, that's how we can do some of that as well. Question mark. Sure. So the, the federal food code talks about the boards may require uh, that a, a mobile unit have a base of operation because they really should be storing 
they should be storing food and utensils and doing cleaning at their house. They should be doing it either on the unit uh, or at this base of operation that is a licensed food establishment. So, so that that is a you know if if another you know a potential is that you could say hey look at Jeff you need to have a, a, a base of operation to be able to do this. Our quick question, are the ones that are currently licensed in Littleton, because I know you've been handling that with a bunch of other towns, do the mobile trucks that we have that come through town have a base of operations where they have, you know, all of the appropriate food handling and stuff like that? So uh, my understanding is they've gotten licensed, they do have a base of operations because it's one of the things we ask for. And there's, okay. one, there's a place locally that a bunch of them go to, almost like a commissary built for this purpose. Got it. Because okay. it's also, if, if you're truly mobile, then you need a place to dump the wastewater. And, you know, we've talked to people who says, yeah, I just you go over a catch base and you dump the wastewater. It's like, no, that's not a good so. <laughs> Why not? Well, no, but as you point out, you know, some units are going to be at the more stable end of the spectrum. They are move yeah. up, but they're connected into electricity. They're connected into water. I mean, you start to say, well, do they need a home base of operations if they have a refrigerator built into the unit and they're taking care of things? I think that's where, like you said, um, right, Kevin, I, I think it's more about a template for a plan so that we can say, how are you meeting all of these requirements? And yeah, it's going to vary from cart to cart. And some we're going to have to ask questions or put requirements on. And others we're going to say, oh, that seems to make sense. You just have to make sure you're doing these last three things. So I agree. It's bring us the plan as to how you're going to deal with all of these things. And I think that at least starts us down a path of reasonable conversation. Yeah. And I think we can utilize this conversation on the 14th uh, in conjunction with the, the mass food code and the documents that Jim has sent over regarding mobile food establishments uh, to sort of craft, you know, anything that we want, we want to emphasize uh, as more and more folks apply. Uh, for these types of things. So uh, please, please read over those documents uh, over the next couple of weeks and uh, we'll have a constructive conversation uh, at our next meeting on it. Uh, any more comments on this before we move on? All right. Moving on, uh, administrative matters. I did not see any meeting minutes for approval in the packet. Uh, Brenda is not here. I hope she's all right. I haven't had any uh, correspondence with her since yesterday. So, um, correspondence that we did receive uh, from Alex McCurdy regarding Littleton Volunteer Corps. I think everybody saw that. Um, was there any other? Oh, you guys did not see Alex's? Email. Yeah, I see these emails. I, I think what I'm going to do is just create like a blind group. And when I see these things, not even jam up Brenda's inbox with her, uh, but just send them to board members and Jim and uh, I just don't reply. That'd be great. Does anyone else have any correspondence they'd like to discuss? Any member updates? It, there is a piece of correspondence in the back of the packet. Okay. Or a letter or something yeah. at the very end of the packet. Uh, regarding eco dynamics. Eco dynamics. The perk yeah, I kind of wonder because, you know, a long time ago, I used to see a lot more regular emails of just system, um, system tests and re results reports. <laughs> I haven't yeah. seen a lot of those lately. And yeah, I we haven't. I have requested that we not receive those because we really don't know what any of that stuff means. And Jim sort of goes goes over it. And if there's a red flag or a question, he'll he'll sort of let us know or ask us. Okay, um, that's what I was going to ask. Is like, what what do we want? This, this operation and maintenance agreement is regarding Cooper Farm, uh, so I believe that's why it was included <clears throat> in the uh, in the packet. And probably the important part on that, if you're looking at that document, yeah, um, it lists the uh, actual water flow and the system design flow, um, and you can see it's about half. And you know that the, the uh, kind of the design flows for Title Five are the the number that we use for design is a has a, like a factor of two safety in there, 
And you mm-hmm. can see that that kind of plays out, particularly in that case there. That I, I think all but one unit is built in that development. Yep. And that's an over 55, 100, 150 gallons a day? Correct. And this... Sorry, I'm just looking at this. So we're at 45, 40 gallons per day out of 99, 30. Okay. Yeah, these are these are just good numbers to, to pass pass along to the town council too. But this is so what that's saying is that that it that it's doing what? It's it's under half of so what Jim is saying that that <clears throat> it's allowed ninety nine thirty, and it's doing half. Uh, it's doing half of it right and now. We want, and, we, and so it, by Title Five, it would be a lot, basically we want to see up to forty nine sixty five. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> up to so, so it's it's running under the design flow essentially. Right, this, this capacity there, and, and in actuality, the system is designed to handle. 9930 and, mm-hmm. and the title five designs at that factor too to kind of even out peaks and valleys. Right. So we have we have 425 gallons per day. On average over the year. Daily. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So as Jim pointed out, there can be Peak peaks time. and valleys. Yeah. There can be peaks and valleys where, like say, holidays, where there's a lot of flow going through the system and you may exceed, but we don't know. Right. So, so, <clears throat> but I, as a baseline, you know, we yep. can use, use these numbers. And so there's a Delta there, 425 gallons per day, uh, minus the 150 on the to be built unit that leaves us with 275 gallons per day. Um, and so once we go through our spreadsheet and determine how many homes have 10 rooms or sorry, nine rooms, as opposed to, um, you know, I guess the seven, uh, then we'll be able to de- determine uh, how much flow is left. Um, and we'll have to have a conversation with town council and, and the HOA. You mentioned the one more um, 55 and over unit. Mm-hmm. What, do you, was that on the map or is that to be added? So, cause I was counting those up. So um, like they keep it 15 that had an address that were on that spreadsheet. Do you think it's one more beyond that then? Correct. So okay. the original permit for that development uh, was for 21 single family homes and 20 um, over 55 condos. And yeah. then they came back at some point in time to the board and said, hey, look, at we'd like to kind of re- you know, kind of recalculate this. So we're going to put in three more single family homes and we'll take out four of the over 55s. So that's where you ended up with 24 and 16 instead. Oh, I have 23 and 16 because curiously, if it's 24 and 16, it's over 10,000. Okay. Then let me check my numbers. So they, they came 20, back afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. It, tw- I'm guessing it's 23 and 16 because yep. that comes to 9,990. Okay. Yeah. So I'll check. Like I said, yeah. we looked at that when they came back and. Cool, cool. So yeah. I'll, um, I'm going to get the, the spreadsheet um, that Brenda had included in the packet and add a couple more rows and columns, and we can really do our calculations and see where everything stands, send it to town council, and, you know, get a, get a determination. Um, that'll just take a little bit of a, a load off us, I think. So. Uh, what else? We need to really make sure that we identify... Any of those basement addition clarifications or whatever that come in that are on a shared septic system, like some big, really freaking flag is set somewhere. Mm. And that we have one of these calculations at our fingertips because, yeah. Sorry. Uh, there, there's no one in the audience, so we have no public input. Um, but now would be the time for board member updates, comments for discussion. Does anyone have anything in addition? Uh, and if not, uh, Dan King. 
super quick. It's holiday season, which uh, is a wonderful festive time of year, but it also for many folks can be a particularly stressful or emotional time. So never be afraid to reach out for, for help from friends, colleagues, employee assistance, certainly 988 as the crisis emergency number or in, in a true emergency, feel free to call 911 and our police and fire professionals are always happy to help. And also it's Christmas tree season, trees are starting to go up. If you have a natural tree, make sure you keep them watered. Don't let your dog drink out of it. They can as long as you refill it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys. I think all we need now is a motion to adjourn. So moved. All right. We have a motion. Second. 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 Roll call vote. Kevin Davis. Kevin Davis says yes. Gino Fratelloni. Yes, sir. Dan Kane. Thank you. Dan Kane says yes. Matt Wason. Matt Wason, yes. And Kevin Baker. Have a good yes. week. Thank you, Jim, for everything. Uh, thank you, Dave. Thank you. Thanks, guys. We'll see you no, uh, December 14th, but I'll send a bunch of emails, so you're going to be mad at me. All right. <laughs>